my video on writing ionic formulas with Dr. Dan. So this is for introductory chemistry, and we're going to learn about how to write ionic formulas. So how do we go about doing that? So there's four simple steps for how to write an ionic formula for ionic compounds. So an ionic compound is whenever you have a plus and a minus charge that are going to be bonding together. So it must be a metal and a non-metal that are going to be bonding together. So that's the first thing. So when we do that, we have to first determine what the predictable charges are of the ions, which is going to involve using your periodic table and any reference sheets that you might have for polyatomic ions. Um, you're then going to be writing the symbols of each of those different species. You're going to write them side by side. Uh, you're always going to write that metal first. Don't forget to do that. And then we're going to go through and do, learn about the swap drop method, which is a really easy way of how to get these charges to show correctly and to be balanced properly. Sometimes we're going to have to reduce the subscripts that we're going to show when we are writing this. So let's go through it and try to understand how we are going to do this. So I have a periodic table here for us to reference to. So that when we go through a couple different examples that it will make a little bit more sense. Um, so why don't we start with just a, a simpler molecule. So let's say if I have something like sodium chloride. So sodium chloride, what that one is, so you know, we all use that for table salt. We have our metal and our non-metal. So the way that we determine, is it a metal, right? It has to be on the left side of this zigzag that's here, right? So if it's on the left side of that zigzag, it's a metal. So we have sodium, which is all the way over here, right? So I'm trying to make that a little bit more obvious for us. So sodium is in the first column. So all first column elements are going to be a plus one charge. Now, when it comes to over here on the on the other side of the periodic table, right, we have our noble gases, which are zero, and then negative one. So chlorine would have a negative one charge. And let's just fill in all these other predictable charges too to save ourselves some time. So that means that sodium is going to have a plus one charge. Chlorine is going to have a minus one charge. So that is step one. We also wrote the metal first, which was also our step two. So we kind of did two things, that, two things at once, right? We just figured out the predictable charges and we wrote our metal first. So the swap drop method is really simple. So if we think that this one's a plus one charge, this is a negative one charge, what we're gonna be doing is trading, is essentially writing the, using the charges to determine the subscripts. So before we do that, let's just review really quick what the difference between a subscript is and a superscript. So if I have some kind of species, essentially all these different elemental symbols have two little boxes next to them. One of them is, looks like an exponent, the other one looks like a really under number. So in this case, this is shown as a subscript, which tells you how the number of atoms, okay? And now for this upper one, this tells you what the superscript tells you the charge of that species. So if it's a plus one, that's going to be that charge. If it's negative one, it's going to be that charge there. So it's always going to give you some of that information, which is really important when we're trying to figure out all these little pieces. So what we're going to be doing is swapping the numbers, which is going to create the subscripts for each of these species. So we're going to trade the ones. So when we do that, we're going to be rewriting this sodium chloride as Na1 chlorine 1, and that would be our chemical formula. However, when we have ones, we don't have to write them. We can just simplify it to just say that this is NaCl, and that would be our first formula. So why don't we try to do a couple more together so that way we can get the feel of it, get some practice in with this, and hopefully it can get you get the ball rolling on you being able to successfully write ionic formulas for everyday use for your chemistry class. So with this, right, let's do another one. Let's say I have um, lithium and oxygen. So first thing we got to do is determine what the predictable charges are. So why don't we do that? And, as, and we also figure out which one's the metal, which one's the non-metal. So lithium, we can see, is on the left side here. So that's our metal. So the way we wrote it was just perfect. It's in the first column. So that's that means that, all right, well, first column, that's going to be a plus one. Now, oxygen is all the way in 
the sec the second column over here, which I'm trying to highlight, but it's not showing up too well. That one's going to be a negative two, right? So we have negative two for oxygen and a negative or sorry, positive one for lithium. So plus one, let's write that in another color. So plus one for lithium and then negative two for oxygen. All right. So next step, what was it? So we want to make sure that the metal is written first, which it is. Lithium was our metal. Now we're going to swap drop and reduce if necessary. Okay. So let's trade our numbers. So the one go turns into the subscript for oxygen. And now the two turns into the subscript for lithium. So when we write that, this new number is now going to be where we have Li with a two for a subscript. Notice how we don't write the charge, no negatives or pluses. It's just a number. Now we're also going to write the oxygen. And that one's going to have a one next to it, so we don't have to worry about writing it. So this is our correct answer for this example. Let's do another. So for another type of species, this is um, going to be aluminum. Let's do aluminum and nitrogen. So how do we figure out these charges? So this one is, these are both predictable as well. So just to kind of add in a little note for maybe your chemistry class, if you have to determine if, it, if it's a type 1 ionic or type 2 ionic, which some courses do require, this these are all considered to be type 1 ionic compounds. That means that they're predictable. So there is a set charge that's always the same on the periodic table, regardless of what situation it's used. It's always the same charge, which makes it a lot easier to memorize and to go off of. And it's going off our columns, which is always good, um, which is an easy way. But however, aluminum is, what would aluminum be? It's, if we kind of like zoom in on our periodic table, you see that it's like right here. How do we know that charge? Well, there's a little simple little method I remember for three of these metals, which I refer to as the steps. So we have silver, zinc, and aluminum. So aluminum is in the third column here. So with that Roman numeral three. So this is going to have a plus three charge. Well, now if we walk down the steps to zinc, it's going to have a plus two charge. And then silver is going to have a plus one charge. Write that down on your periodic table for your class. So that way you have it for later. It's going to always be that predictable charge. And it's, if you can remember the steps, it will save you on a lot of problems. You can trust me on that for later, especially with uh, my own experience of chemistry. It definitely can make a difference. So aluminum is a plus three. Now let's look for nitrogen. Nitrogen is over here on this third column right here. So that I'm circling right now in blue. Let's erase oxygen here because we're not looking at that one now. So that is going to be a negative three charge. Okay, let's take a look at this. So we have a positive three and a negative three. Let's swap drop them. So when we swap drop the chart, the numbers, that's going to be our subscripts. So now we have aluminum with a three next to it and a nitrogen with a three next to it. Now, is that the correct way to look at this? Well, what we have to do now is we have to, this is a, our first situation where we have to reduce, meaning that if the subscripts are divisible or, or they can be divided by a common number, then you reduce it. So what would be the common number of this one? Well, they're both three, right? So we can divide both these numbers by three, which would essentially tell you that, all right, well, we have aluminum nitride would be our actual answer. And why is that? Well, it has to be all about balancing your charges. Being that one of these is plus three, the other one is negative three, you have to have an overall neutral compound. It has to be a, it has to not have a charge, it has to be neutral. So in this case, being that we have a plus three minus three, it cancels out to be zero. So that's something to always kind of keep in the back of your mind when you are checking your charges, that when you subtract these two, it's going to equal to zero. And that's something that, that's going to help you with for later. 
Um, now, what about if you have, let's say, what we refer to as a type 2 ionic compound? Well, that's telling you that it's not predictable anymore. That's something where you have a variable charge. So variable is always referring to anything that's generally is a transition metal. So a lot of the transition metals have variable charges. So you have to try to calculate and determine what that charge is. So for example, if we did the following one where I have, let's pick lead and oxygen. Well, earlier when we found oxygen, it had a negative two charge. So we know what that charge is. However, lead, we can't find it. So the reason is, if you look on the periodic table, lead is right, I always kind of get this one lost, right? It's right here on the periodic table. It's It doesn't have a charge. It's under like the fourth column. It's going to be something that's variable. So it can either be a plus two or a plus four charge for lead. So we want to try to figure out which one is it. So when we are going to be doing this, well, we need to try to figure out what is, what could it possibly be? Well, these can be presented to you in a couple different ways. One of them could be that, all right, well, maybe it already gives you the compound. So now you need to figure out, all right, what was the charge of it? So you can learn how to name it correctly. Um, another way that it could be possibly given is maybe we already give you the charge and we have to go through the entire reduction method as well. So let's say, for example, I'm going to give us an example where let's say we already know the compound. In this case, it's going to be lead oxide. So just like this. So we have lead and an O2. So how do we figure out the charge of this? Well, like I mentioned before, we know that oxygen is negative two. So what is lead? So we have to do some simple little math. Remember that the whole entire ionic compound must be neutral. So it has to have a zero charge. So this whole thing had, does not have a charge. So we know that we have one lead molecule or one lead atom. So we don't know what the charge is. However, we do know it's going to be positive because it is a metal. Now, oxygen, there's two of them, and that has to do with this subscript here. So being that there's two oxygens, and they each have a negative two charge, we can go through and do some little mathematics here. So we can try to figure out like, all right, well, what is going to be our missing charge in this case? Well, when we do this, we're going to see very quickly that in order for this to balance out, we're going to get negative four for our oxygens. And then lead is going to just be our whatever our unknown value is. That's all set to zero. So we can now cancel out four on both sides here. And what we'll see is that our unknown charge for lead is going to be positive four. And that's because it's always neutral. We need to make sure that we have the same charge when we're adding them together. So negatives and positives should balance out. So our compound for this, we can label our charges. So being that we had lead oxide, we can write that, all right, this is plus four, and this was negative two when we go through the charge. Now, there's other types of species you might come across as well, which could be potentially polyatomic ions. Um, for polyatomic ions, uh, these are going to be from a set list of ions. I'm going to make another video to show how to work with polyatomic ions. So keep watching and subscribe and like the channel to see more content. And I hope that this helped you a little bit. Um, so don't forget to use your rules when you're doing these ionic compounds. And I hope to see you again in the future for future videos. Thank you so much. And I hope to see you again. Bye, y'all.